So without any further ado, Gary Evans. Well, thank you very much, um, Simon, and uh, let me express at the outset my very warm appreciation of the Stanley Foundation, the Australian Mission, and the Global Centre for bringing us together and you all for taking the time to be here. I've learned from long experience over the years that there are very few in the universe more sceptical or cynical about big ideas than working journalists. <laughs> and, of course, responsibility to protect is one of the biggest ideas of them all with the British historian who we love to quote, Martin Gilbert, um, going so far as to say this is the most significant adjustment to sovereignty in 360 years. Well, there you go. But what I, do, what I hope I can persuade you is that this is an idea that's now here to stay, that it has already made a difference, and that it will continue to do so. Although there are still many challenges to overcome, not least of those that, the ones that have become evident in the aftermath of Libya with the degree of buyer's remorse that's been visible around town as a result of the way in which the military operation was conducted, if not initiated. I appreciate that uh, you around the table, journalists around the table, will have, will have varying degrees of familiarity with the concept. And what I'll try to do in these remarks is steer a course between assuming you know nothing and assuming you know everything. Um, but I think the best way of doing this is to track the sort of evolution of the concept from its beginnings to where we are now in three stages, the what we might call the birth and early childhood of R2P up to the 2005 World Summit, the adolescence of R2P through to the end of 2010, and uh, what I like to call the maturity of R2P, which we've been experiencing since then. Um, Ambassador Puri would no doubt want me to add a fourth age of man's senility is uh, possibly appropriate, but I want to argue that that's, uh, that's, that's inappropriate and uh, that we've got a lot more life in us uh, so far as the concept is concerned. First thing to say about the, the birth and early evolution of Responsibility to Protect is that it was born of a perception of political need. It was a political response to a political problem. There was, of course, a well-established body of international humanitarian law and international human rights law uh, developed, particularly in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. But very little of that was actually being observed when it came to what we now call mass atrocity crimes. Genocide, major crimes against humanity, including ethnic cleansing, major war crimes. There really was a catastrophic um, series of cases with which we're all familiar Cambodia in the mid-70s, uh, the East Pakistan, Uganda cases also, which really then exploded into even worse horrors in many ways in the 1990s with the catastrophic inability of the international community to respond effectively to Rwanda, uh, the mess that it made of the Srebrenica uh, massacre situation just a year later. And then the, uh, the story in Kosovo when there was a reaction, and I would argue an appropriate one, but not one that commanded the assent of the Security Council because of the threatened Russian veto. And through all of that period, we did have a situation of really fundamental ideological difference uh, evident between the global north, on the one hand, which was obsessed with the notion of humanitarian intervention, the right to intervene, the right of humanitarian intervention, uh, articulated in particular by Bernard Kouchner of Médecins Sans Frontières, the Droit d'Insurance, and on the other hand, um, the global south, uh, which by and large was utterly unpersuaded of the merits of acknowledging the right of anyone to throw their weight around uh, in any of these sorts of situations and who much preferred to hang their collective hat on Article 2.7 of the Charter, saying, in effect, no intervention in matters essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state, and giving a ex pretty extensive reading to what constituted domestic jurisdiction and not being very inclined to acknowledge that there'd been much limitation of that internal uh, freedom of action by the body of international human rights and humanitarian law. So there was a real standoff, which I think those of us who were at all following events uh, through the 90s uh, can well remember. Thus, Kofi Annan's uh, famous challenge in his 2000 Millennium uh, Report that if um, humanitarian intervention 
as he put it, is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty. How should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that offend every precept of our common humanity? And that was the challenge to which the Canadian government uh, responded by establishing the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which reported <coughs> just over 10 years ago and whose 10th anniversary, in a sense, the Stanley Foundation has brought us together to, to celebrate. And I'm particularly delighted to acknowledge, among others around the table, the presence here of Michael Ignatieff, who was an absolutely crucial member um, of that commission. I think the Commission made three big contributions to the debate. One was to <coughs> really turn the concept of the right to intervene upside down by re-articulating the issue as not the right of anyone's to intervene, but rather the responsibility of everyone in the international community to protect, putting the emphasis not on throwing your weight around, but on the perspective of the, the victims, the sufferers. The second contribution was to really broaden the range of actors that were seen as relevant, whereas humanitarian intervention had focused entirely really on external players uh, who would engage in military action in extreme situations. The responsibility to protect formulation uh, focused very much in the first instance on the responsibility of the sovereign states themselves, uh, developing this Francis Deng, Roberta Cohen idea of sovereignty as responsibility, which they first developed in the context of IDPs, internationally displaced persons, <coughs> and arguing that it was only when a sovereign state uh, failed to, or was incapable of meeting that responsibility, that any kind of responsibility shifted to the wider international community with a cast of players then identified as having responsibilities to act appropriately. And the third thing that the, the, um, the Commission did, the third big thing, was to make it clear that there needed to be a much broader range of responses to these situations than simply the military response, which was at the heart and soul of the notion of humanitarian intervention, which had proved so controversial um, through the 90s. And thus you had um, the emphasis in the original commission report on the three stages, in a sense, the responsibility to prevent both long-term and in the imminent approach of catastrophe, the responsibility to react, but by a whole variety of methods, um, including diplomatic persuasion, negotiation, and then non-coercive, um, <coughs> non-military uh, coercive measures, uh, targeted sanctions, threats of criminal prosecution and the like, and only then uh, in the reaction phase uh, acknowledging the possibility of military action in extreme cases, and then focusing as well um, on the post-conflict or post-crisis obligation to rebuild, which is in a sense the prevention uh, part of the story coming round again, as this time you work on longer term structural measures to ensure a non-recurrence of the catastrophe in question. So that broad, nuanced, multi-dimensional approach to responses, a much broader approach to the relevant actors, and a fundamental re-articulation of the issue, not in terms of right, but in terms of responsibility, was, I think, the big contribution of the Commission. What happened thereafter in the early childhood phase was the translation of that Commission report many of which, of course, have had long and dusty lives in shelves um, after their breathless enunciation to the world. But the big thing that happened was the translation of this into the 2005 World Summit, or UN General Assembly um, Agreed Outcome Document, paragraphs 138, 139. It really is a bit of a miracle that the, um, the Responsibility Protect concept survived uh, that birth passage. Um, given that the issue had dropped off the radar screen generally post 9-11, everybody wanted to talk about terrorism, not mass atrocity crimes, and given the just inherent difficulty of getting anyone to agree about anything in the run-up to uh, that world summit and during the conduct of the summit itself. It's a story in itself which I won't stop to tell now about how it all happened, but it is, I think, important to acknowledge that one of the things that made it happen was the strong commitment of sub-Saharan African countries to getting the responsibility to protect embraced uh, in 2005. 
with South Africa and others articulating the issue as not about the sin of intervention, but about the sin of indifference and wanting to see in the aftermath of Rwanda and similar cases, a much more seriously articulated commitment to an appropriate response. We also had the Latin American countries, and this is interesting again in the light of South Africa's and Brazil's current position, we had the Latin American countries, including Brazil, also being very articulate supporters in the run-up to 2005 um, of this in a way that's pretty interesting given their particular history of anxiety about um, civilising forces to their uh, external north. But that support from the, from the south, from key elements of the south, was very important. The Asian uh, group by and large was, the, um, was the, uh, the last to be persuaded about the utility of this enterprise and that record continues to some extent uh, to today and we'll no doubt have uh, some interesting discussion with Ambassador Puri about this in just uh, in the next session. But without going into any more detail, we did see the concept embraced with some variations of language, some narrowing of the language in particular, the focus very clearly on the, the big four crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and war crimes. And uh, we had, after that embrace by the General Assembly at head of government and state level, we had within the following year uh, the UN Security Council itself very importantly endorsing the concept. But of course, that was just potentially rhetoric. It had to be translated into effective action. And that, I think, was what we saw starting to happen during the next phase I want to talk about, the, the adolescence, if you like, of R2P in the period from 2005 up to uh, the first part of 2011, last year. For R2P to move from uh, paper to effective practical substance, um, three big challenges really had to be met, which all of us knew was the case. There was a conceptual challenge, there was an institutional challenge, and there was, as always, the political challenge. The conceptual challenge was to get real practical agreement as to what responsibility to protect actually meant in particular real world situations as distinct from what it meant as an abstraction. And I have to say in this context that um, the role that Ed Luck has played as the uh, Special Advisor to the Secretary General in writing the, the three big reports that have appeared so far and have been the foundations for the debate in the General Assembly in 2009-2011 uh, have been very effective uh, contributions to that conceptual clarity, not least in the way in which we now have it universally accepted that what R2P is about in that language of the paragraphs of the 2005 outcome document, what it's about uh, is three pillars. The first pillar, the responsibility of the state itself, um, not to act in any way which, which harms uh, civilians in the ways uh, that we're concerned with. Uh, the second pillar is, of course, the responsibility of other members of the international community to assist a state that's in a mood to be assisted uh, in whatever way is necessary to help it meet that responsibility. And the third pillar is the responsibility of the wider uh, community to engage in whatever way is necessary in the event that the state is, quote, manifestly failing uh, to meet that responsibility, with the possibility being opened up in Pillar 3, although by no means confined to this, to um, enforcement action under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter and all the many dimensions of that. So we had, at the formal level, that kind of clarification, conceptual clarity uh, taking shape over this period. And we also, I think, had informally, in the context of the debates that took place in a whole sequence of practical evolving situations, the gradual emergence of um, much greater genuine, uh, genuinely accepted uh, agreement about what this actually meant in practice. Uh, so that, I think, if you sort of summarise, I think the cases of Darfur, um, Congo, Sri Lanka, none of which uh, are brilliant examples of responsibility to protect actually at work in terms of effective action, but in terms of the conceptualization of them as R2P situations, situations of concern, uh, that was pretty clear in each one of those cases over this period. Equally, in the case of Burma, Myanmar, we had the argument about whether uh, the catastrophic cyclone and its aftermath, not a man-made event, but the issue being whether the Burmese government's reaction to that event 
was such as to create a, an R2P situation. I think that argument went backwards and forwards in 2008, but it did help to clarify um, a lot of people's minds um, with, I think, the generally accepted view now being, not necessarily at the time, but the view now being that uh, the mere occurrence of such a man, a non-man-made catastrophe was not at all what Responsibility to Protect was all about, but that if the <coughs> Burmese military had continued their neglect and non-responsiveness to that situation to the point that it could be regarded as effectively criminal in terms of a complete negligent disregard as to whether people lived or died, uh, then that might conceivably have in that context um, satisfied the definition of a crime against humanity in the making and been such as to justify um, a full-scale characterization as an RTP event and maybe what followed from that. But that was controversial with Bernard Kushner being very enthusiastic about military action, most people much more cautious in the event. Uh, the Burmese military did uh, respond to diplomatic pressure from the region in particular and the issue played itself out without coming finally to a head. But it was an important exercise in conceptual clarification. I think where it really all came together was the Kenyan case at the end of 2007, uh, beginning of 2008, when you'll remember in the aftermath of the contested election there, uh, there was some horrific violence very quickly perpetrated, taking the form of people being burnt alive and churches with doors locked and 20,000 or more people being displaced uh, for essentially ethnic reasons from the Rift Valley. And I think there was a very quick international willingness to characterise this as a responsibility to protect a situation demanding some appropriate action, which action in fact took the form, as you'll remember, of the diplomatic uh, mediation intervention of Kofi Annan under the auspices both of the UN and the African Union, which is an interesting demonstration that even in the most extreme and ugly of these situations, um, there are other responses available in the repertoire that can be effective. Uh, than the military one. Uh, we also had during this period uh, the attempt by uh, Russia to characterise its intervention in South Ossetia and Georgia as being a responsibility to protect enterprise. Um, I think the, the, uh, the horse laughs with which that particular characterisation were greeted internationally was itself um, an important um, clarifying um, exercise. Uh, so one way and another, we had the conceptual issues sort of sorting themselves out with an understanding that it was the responsibility to protect was not about human security issues generally, including natural disasters, it was only about the four crimes, with an understanding that there had to be some sort of scale and contem contemporaneity, some immediate reality about the threats involved if a situation was to be, uh, be characterised um, as something demanding at least robust responsive action and generally um, an acceptance as to what are and what are not R2P situations. I think in the, in the future we'll be further assisted in the enterprise of characterising situations and this continuing conceptual clarity by the R2P monitor, the sort of watch list, the first edition of which is in front of you, which has just been put out by the, the Global Centre, which is, um, it doesn't focus on the long-term preventive structural situations which are a part of the R2P story. It focuses very specifically on what can be described as situations of current R2P concern, those where there's an actual current crisis, an explosion of ugliness happening in front of our eyes, where there's an imminent risk of that occurring, or where there's a serious concern that it will uh, occur or recur within the foreseeable future if effective action is not taken. But I think um, the, the ongoing conceptual debate, to the extent that there is one, will be helped by that kind of uh, document being in front of us in the future, and I congratulate Simon and his team at the Centre on producing it. Uh, the second challenge that needed to be met during the, uh, what I've described as the adolescence period, was the institutional one. Unless you can start putting together the kinds of practical resources within governments, within regional organisations, within global uh, intergovernmental organisations, um, there's not much chance um, of this generating effective reaction, as distinct from, again, just talk. And I think what we've seen over this period is the beginnings of a meeting of that institutional challenge. In particular, we've seen a lot of attention being paid uh, to the establishment of so-called focal points, uh, people whose day job it is to worry about this stuff uh, within 
national governments and, and uh, intergovernmental organisations. Uh, we've seen it in several European countries, we've seen it in the US with Samantha Power's shop in the NSC and the new Atrocities Prevention Board that Obama's in the process of establishing. We've seen it at the UN itself with the formal establishment now of the Joint uh, Office of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide, Francis Deng, with Edward Luck as the Special Advisor on R2P. And we're beginning to see, I think, a much more systematic um, set of responses to these situations on a gradually emerging whole of government and whole of organisation basis as a result of this kind of institutional effort. Uh, we're seeing a lot of attention being paid of varying degrees of effectiveness to putting together mediation uh, teams and uh, just generally improving our capacity uh, to play that diplomatic prevention role. Um, we're seeing some attention being paid to the kind of military configurations and doctrine and training uh, that are necessary to mount the kind of fire brigade operations um, with or without the consent of the government concerned uh, that have been argued to be necessary in extreme cases uh, where that would actually work. And of course we've, um, we've been seeing um, the further consolidation of the role of the International Criminal Court and the other international uh, tribunals and I'm um, delighted to have uh, Fatou Bensouda with us in a new role as the uh, about to take office uh, new chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court and that's become of course a very important part and not uncontested, not, uh, not an area without its sensitivities, a part of the responsibility to protect repertoire but it's there and that institutional development has been quite important and needs to go quite a lot further. Politically um, the challenge was during this period from 2005 to 2010 really to consolidate political acceptance of the concept of responsibility to protect and to deal with the multiple attempts that were made during that period uh, by spoilers of one kind or another who didn't like what had been done in 2005 and were determined to take every opportunity to try and undermine that basic consensus. That's an effort that I think it's fair to say has spectacularly failed. It first became really evident in the 2009 General Assembly uh, interactive dialogue, the first of the big debates, um, and no, one o'clock or five hours. Um, and uh, when it became apparent that although there was certainly, and this has continued to be the case in subsequent um, subsequent uh, debates in last year and uh, 2010, while well, it's certainly the case that there's a higher degree of comfort with so-called Pillars 1 and Pillars 2 than there is with Pillar 3, and that you do start to get um, a lot of sensitivities and anxieties raised when you move into the, the more coercive uh, response end of the spectrum. Nonetheless, in terms of a willingness to actually throw out the whole responsibility to protect concept, uh, that's now a very, very, very small minority taste. Even in 2009, there are only four countries Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba and Sudan uh, that actually opposed outright uh, the 2005 consensus and really those numbers have been uh, reducing even further um, since. And to just jump forward a little bit, I think it's worth saying that in the um, 2011 debates last year, uh, there were a couple of them in different contexts, um, but the interactive dialogue preeminent among them in mid-year, even in the context of last year when there was a lot of anxiety about the way in which the Libyan intervention was going, still it was absolutely clear that there was very strong political support continuing for the basic responsibility to protect um, concept. So um, there it is. We had Ban Ki-moon, I think, well articulating in September of last year the state of play when he said, look, the debate now is about how uh, R2P should apply, not whether it should apply. There is now a general acceptance in principle of it. So I think we can say that all of those uh, challenges were met to the extent that I've described um, during that interim period. Then we come to 2011, the maturity phase, and I'll be quick here because we are going to have a full debate about this in the next session, but just to simply explain my take on I think where we're at now. It really did come to maturity, I think, in two ways, um, with two big events in 2011. Uh, the first was uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, which did result in uh, Security Council unanimously conferring a military mandate uh, to deal with the situation there as it was finally unfolding in March. 
one can debate uh, the extent to which Cote d'Ivoire was a pure um, responsibility to protect the case, because there were, of course, uh, it was quite a long and complex story which had led up to it in terms initially of a response to a, um, a contested election and a regional response to that. And you can argue that the, uh, the military intervention that was finally authorised by the Security Council had at least as much to do with, with force protection as it did with um, dealing with civilian protection. But nonetheless, um, responsibility protect was clearly articulated as a rationale for the, for the military um, mandate that was given, and it was very successfully and very briskly concluded, and I don't think there's been too much buyer's remorse about um, Cote d'Ivoire. Libya was the really big case um, last year, as we all know, and what uh, I've said uh, publicly and say again now is I think at least initially Libya was an absolutely textbook case of the application of the responsibility to protect in a situation where clearly any early stage prevention had long since ceased to be relevant when we were facing an imminent uh, catastrophe and working on sort of last stage preventive measures and then reactive measures. The last stage preventive measures were those that the Security Council embraced in its uh, February resolution uh, 1970 in which uh, there was very strong uh, condemnation of Gaddafi uh, for what he'd been doing with unarmed um, civilians in particular, and the threats were articulated of um, reference to the International Criminal Court, uh, the application of targeted sanctions, and generally it was made very clear that the implications would be very serious if there was not a dramatic uh, improved response to that. Then, of course, uh, we had, uh, with Gaddafi taking basically no notice of that, three weeks later, the agreement to put in place the, the military mandate in Resolution 1973, with its two dimensions, one, the no-fly zone, all necessary measures to implement, and secondly, much more broadly, which was introduced as a result of um, some last-minute enthusiasm from the US, all necessary measures to protect civilians and civilian, like, civilian populated areas under attack, um, full stop. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, even though some people still want to argue about this, that for the Security Council to act as it did, as quickly and robustly as it did, uh, did forestall what would have been unquestionably humanitarian catastrophe in Benghazi. Um, all the signs were there, and we can debate the pros and cons of this a little bit later. But I think for all the um, second guessing that's gone on subsequently, um, had, the, had there been any doubt about this, it would have been simply impossible to get Arab League support um, for uh, the mandate that was given, even with the distaste that obviously existed in the Arab League for Gaddafi. They would not have gone so far as to as to come out in support of a mandate of this kind had they not genuinely been believed to be um, a atrocity crime really on a large scale about to occur. And I think it's fair to say that for Russia, China and all the other BRICS countries, there was exactly that same uh, perception. And that's why, even though um, it took the form of an abstention rather than a positive vote, why we did see that willingness to go ahead with the implementation of, the, um, of that mandate. The issue, of course, and that generated a, a degree of considerable uh, triumphal uh, spirit among those of us who saw that R2P had at last, in all its dimensions, not just Pillar 1, Pillar 2, but in Pillar 3 as 1, Pillar 3 as well, had shown itself capable of mobilising exactly a very sharply focused international support of the kind which, had it been there in Rwanda in 1994, might have saved, you know, 800,000 lives. The problem, of course, has been uh, the subsequent implementation of that mandate, which has had a number of uh, problems. The rejection of early ceasefire offers that may or may well not have been serious. Uh, the attacking from the air, fleeting personnel that, um, fleeing personnel that posed no immediate risk to civilians, including in the case of the, the convoy in which um, um, Gaddafi himself was uh, intercepted right in the end game. Um, the striking locations were not obviously militarily significant, like the Tripoli compound in which um, Gaddafi's son and other grandchildren uh, were attacked in April. And more generally, the comprehensive support of the rebel side, even to the extent of pretty obviously breaching the Security Council arms embargo in the case of France and Qatar, in what rapidly became a full-scale civil war. And all of those 
uh, aspects of the way in which the mandate were carried out have generated what un unequivocally now is a, a pretty clear case of buyer's remorse on the part of, um, of Russia, China and uh, the IPSA countries, India, Brazil and South Africa, and Ambassador Puri will no doubt want to say a lot more about this, uh, in which we've had, um, as has become evident um, in the response to the Syrian situation, which is certainly as bad as Libya ever was uh, when um, Libyan resolutions were passed, We've had an unwillingness not only to consider the military option, which is understandable for a whole variety of reasons, but an unwillingness to consider um, even a contemnatory resolution um, of the Council, let alone um, intermediate coercive measures like sanctions and references to the criminal court and so on. So what's to be said about where we're at now as a result of all of this? It is a very difficult issue, uh, the issue of the way in which the mandate um, should have been um, conducted. I myself have gone on record as saying I be, would have been much more comfortable if the, um, the NATO-led forces had adopted a kind of monitor and swoop posture rather than full-scale warfighting one. I certainly would have been more comfortable in terms of the language that we used in the original um, commission report where we talked about military intervention in those extreme cases where it did have to happen as being about not war fighting and defeating an enemy in a traditional sense but simply limited targeted action taken to avert or halt uh, an imminent or occurring harm. But of course the more you look at this sort of situation the more you have to acknowledge that it would have been very difficult uh, to maintain or sustain a limited operation of that kind and that there was always something to be said for the argument of the P3 that if you were going to be serious about civilian protection in this case including in those areas uh, within Tripoli and so on within Gaddafi's control which didn't necessarily involve the massing of attackable troops then you did have to be serious about regime change. But, and this is the big but on which I'll basically uh, conclude uh, this part of the story, um, the truth of the matter is that if we are going to retain an atmosphere of consensus, if we are going to be able to mobilise again in a catastrophic, imminent human rights mass atrocity crime situation of this kind, we really have to bring the wider international community along. And both the P3 and the BRICS countries, I do think, need to give a little bit of ground uh, in the period ahead as we work through these issues to reconsolidate um, the sharp end part of what R2P is all about. I think the, the preventive end of what R2P is all about, pillar one, pillar two stuff, is a very well articulated and understood set of uh, parameters which, with which everyone is pretty comfortable. With the sharp end, we still have some distance to go. I think perhaps the, the best way of advancing the debate, there's a lot more to say about this, but I'll be very brief because Simon is glaring at me and we're running out of time. Um, I think the Brazilian uh, proposal for uh, the concept of responsibility while protecting is something that now needs to be discussed very, very seriously indeed. It has two uh, particular themes running through it. The Brazilian proposal has articulated in November and is now currently under discussion. One is the notion that um, there do need to be some pretty clear-cut conditions or, as I would prefer to say, criteria uh, systematically applied before you make a decision of the most extreme kind to apply military force and the kind of language that's in the Brazilian paper about last resort, about proportionality and about um, balance of consequences um, is very, very close to the kind of language that's in the original uh, the Commission report and the High Level Panel report and Kofi Annan's report leading up to 2005 in which we were arguing for the acceptance of clear-cut uh, criteria. Uh, before that extreme step was taken. The other thing which uh, is in the Brazilian paper and I think is very important, although no doubt will be very, very sensitive so far as the P3 is concerned, is the notion that there needs to be some monitoring or review process um, of a kind pretty formally accepted once these mandates are granted to ensure that in their actual implementation and application there's no straying from not only the letter, but the spirit with which they are originally implemented. I've got a lot of sympathy um, for that approach. Making it operational in procedural terms um, is not going to be easy, but I think this is the next stage of what this debate uh, needs to be about. But beyond that, uh, I do think uh, we can 
wrapping it all up as to where RTP is now, um, 10 years after the event. I think it is absolutely alive and well and here to stay, um, as has been evident uh, from the language that's been used over and over again in the General Assembly debates, um, that it is uh, critically important that we acknowledge um, that to the extent that there are any problems about it, they are at the sharp end and they're remedial problems. They're not something that's endemic um, to the, um, the R2P concept itself. And to remind ourselves, last of all, that um, what this whole business was about when it was first articulated by my commission, what the debate has really been about uh, ever since, is the notion that whatever else we do in the conduct of international affairs, for God's sake, don't let's screw up again on the scale that we were doing really for centuries, but more particularly, obviously, in the 1990s when it came to these terrible, terrible mass atrocity crimes. There's always going to be uh, problems of reaching agreement about how we respond in these particular situations, but I really do think um, it's impossible to believe now in the light of what's taken place over the last 10 years, that the world will greet these cases with the same kind of indifference and inaction uh, that was the case in the past. And to that extent, uh, we can be not comfortable, not complacent, but certainly pretty pleased about the progress that's been made. Thank you.